Welcome back to Misunderstood. I'm your host, Rachel Yucatel. So I don't know uh, whether or not you guys know this. March is National Breast Implant Awareness Month. So it was a perfect time to have today's guest. Her name is Andy Liu on to discuss her very personal experiences when it comes to the negative side of breast implants and BII, better known as breast implant illness. Andy is a very successful television presenter in Australia. She's written 10 books on everything from wellness to dating. A couple of years ago, she started to feel sick. She was tired. She had um, symptoms like brain fog, digestive issues, rapid hair loss. These symptoms can mean a million different things, of course, but she had this gut feeling it was due to her breast implants. She went from doctor to doctor and no one believed her. Luckily, she was her own best advocate and fought to be heard in her memoir, Treasured Chest, Exposed closing implants and empowering you. She tells the story of how she turned her trauma into triumph and how she's speaking out to try and help other women do the same. Her experience was really scary. And I'm sure a lot of you will be able to relate. So many people get plastic surgery to make themselves feel better, look better and feel more confident. And we talk about the dangers behind that idea and the actual dangers behind the surgery itself. It's a great episode. I learned a lot from Andy and from her research. We all just need to be more aware. And this episode is a great place to start. So sit back, relax, and enjoy my conversation with Andy Liu. Andy, thank you so much for joining me today in Boca, all the way from LA. Thank yeah. you for making the trip. And you'll notice I've got an Australian accent, so it's actually all the way from Australia That's as well. That's right. That's right. And it sounds so chic when you speak with that accent, oh, so I love it. I like your accent, and I love Florida. Oh, you do? Yes. Okay. Yes, yes. Well, the weather happens to be very good right it's now. It's all good. Yeah. It's all good. I'm so grateful that you're having me on Misunderstood. It's just a real opportunity to talk about my latest book. Yeah, yeah, I'm so excited to have you here. So before we get into that, I want to talk about, um, you said you're from Australia, of mm -hmm. course, but you've been in health and wellness and nutrition for decades now, yeah. right? Can you talk about how you got into that? Yeah, I know. I look really good for 72. <laughs> <laughs> I always say that too. I'm like, I should Do tell you? people I'm 60, 65, yeah. and they'll be like, you look amazing. But no, you look great for your age anyways. Oh, thank you. Look. <laughs> Obviously, age is a number. Yeah. And uh, I also say that you don't have to age the way we've been taught. Yeah. So I have been teaching. And it doesn't have to be scary like we've been taught. Right. Like we're going to be ancient. Aging is a privilege. Yeah. Just like, you know, the Kintsugi effect in Japanese, that when things start to fall apart and break, they put it back together with gold instead of clear glue. So the porcelain's now showing up the cracks and flaws. Wow. And I talk about that in my latest book too, that aging is a privilege and let's highlight the privilege of aging and the flaws and the cracks and the scars and everything that we have. You yeah. know, I want to bring that movement now to the world to start embracing who we are and health and wellness and posture and everything is what's attractive to, about, uh, to us and yeah. about us you know our confidence level is also what's so attractive and that's why you know even the title of your podcast misunderstood we are so misunderstood as to who we really are and what makes us attractive so in context to your question yes um, I'm 51 this year I've been teaching health and wellness for 31 years professionally mm -hmm. I've written 10 books mm -hmm. um, you know most of them are bestsellers wow. I'm also a podcast host I was a television host for many many years mm -hmm. radio as well in Australia and and now I'm on a journey, a crusade, if you like, to help people have better health naturally right. and to feel empowered. Right. So it's interesting that you got into this field before you had like a personal experience with, you know, where we're going with this. So was there something, though, in your childhood or while you were in college or whatever that made you say, this is the field I want to go into? Yeah, look, that's an interesting question because I knew I was always obsessed with natural health. Mm -hmm. When I was a small child, I felt really sort of, um, you know, vehemently opposed to medications and drugs. I remember being given some sort of cough syrup and hallucinating, having violent hallucinations and feeling really unwell. Wow. And I always knew that natural health care, because there is a natural alternative to everything, you know, full disclaimer here, um, as a certified food, lifestyle and wellness coach, 
obviously, um, you know, you want to check in with your health practitioner of choice, your yep. doctor. But I understand that there is a natural alternative to everything. And where would we be without the best drugs, doctors, surgeons in the world? We need both. So I'm mm. always aiming to heal the divide and understand that we need both. But when it's the right timing. So only in times of emergency, because you can advance your health naturally by addressing the root cause which is super key because when you do start going on that drug and medication route now you're going to have to heal twice mm. the first is because you haven't addressed the root cause and the second is now to clean up the gut health because the medication destroys the flora and fauna which is why we're always given antibiotics after right. uh, sorry flora uh, we've always after antibiotics we've always been given the probiotics right you know to restore that gut health mm -hmm. but then it also destroys the lining so the actual tissue the wall of the gut is now destroyed as a result of having antibiotics or any kind of drugs and medication, which is why I'm like, let's just acknowledge if we do have to have it, then we have to go in and repair the gut and the nervous system and potentially the hormones as well. Yeah. So hopefully we can try the natural route first mm -hmm. and then we can always go to the medication because it also uh, removes the absorption or the assimilation of nutrition every time you take drug or medication options. So at some point in your life, though, you decided, let me put something foreign in my body. Yeah. <laughs> where where did that come from? Because, I mean, this question, it's not, you know, I'm not asking it to say anything. Most women that we yeah. know have had work done. Um, I know for some people it's about a self-esteem issue. Yeah. For some people, you know, as some people it's about age and they want to just make everything lift up or be yeah. tighter. And then, you know, as time goes on with generations, you see kids younger and younger getting work done yeah. and putting things that are foreign into their body. So what was the journey for you and why did you choose to do? Yeah. So obviously I want to address the elephant in the room. Mm -hmm. And that is if I am a wellness expert, why on earth would I have put uh, breast implants in my body mm -hmm. when we know that there are potential toxins and dangers that are a ticking time bomb. So it was a trauma reason um, mm -hmm. and full disclosure, I don't judge anyone who wants to do anything to themselves. It was a real healing journey for me to address the root cause of why I chose to do that to myself in the first place. A lot of women who explant do carry deep shame that they have to sort of get over because there is an international narrative of like, well, you did this to yourself, so I'm not going to help you get over this breast implant illness, mm. you know, and the healthcare system doesn't cover it. So a lot of women are dying to be well because they're trying to save up for this potentially $14,000 and beyond surgery. Right. So they're carrying the deep shame. Then I had to remove, uh, you know, all of the shame that I carried, but then address it publicly with my audience. Yeah. So that was a whole nother level. And then I also had to address the root cause of why I did this, which was the trauma. The deep trauma healing was major for me. It was like a good year or two of psychologists, NET, neuroemotional technique, chiropractors, kinesiologists, and just anything and everything, hypnotherapy, yeah. to really um, remove that wall that I had up. So having the breast implants on me made me feel less like a prepubescent woman who mm. was traumatized on that level right. and then uh, more like a woman with some sort of armor or protection shield over my chest it's really hard to describe but that's kind of what I was expressing to my healthcare professionals as what it meant for me that right. helped me feel safe if you like in an intimate space right. but everybody has their own story right and I realized when I went public I wasn't the only one mm. you know people were fl flooding into my dms and saying oh my gosh thank you so much for addressing trauma as one of the reasons of why we implant yeah it's really interesting you talk about that because you don't hear a lot of people saying they're getting um, any sort of surgery because of trauma, because of shame, because of you know how that makes them feel that they need to change um, their physical appearance. You usually yeah. hear them talking about it because they want to be more sexy. They just don't like how their boobs look. It's much more you know um, infantile, I want to say, as, as where they come up with the reasons. But I, I, I do think that's very interesting that you're saying a lot of people identified with the fact that they had something done to their body to make them get away from some sort of trauma yeah, or shame. Yeah, and it, I feel like it's becoming a new hashtag Me Too movement mm. where women are realizing that they did this for other deeper reasons and that they also felt a little bit upsold with the secondary surgery. Like a lot of women went in after they had a child and just wanted a lift and now they're saying, I got talked in 
into having yeah. these devices and all I wanted was a lift. Yeah. And now I'm stuck with this potential, you know, rupture or, um, you know, saline implants can produce mould over time. And right. then just there's new data to support now. Yeah. After my surgery, the professor that did the surgery uh, went and got some new data to support that implants are indeed an inflammatory driver creating a cytokine storm. Mm. So there are women now joining the dots and going, this is the reason for the early onset of the autoimmune illness. This is the reason for my SIBO gut, small intestinal bowel overgrowth, because mm. the heavy metals within the product is a perfect breeding ground for strep A, strep B, E. coli, bacterial overgrowth. Hence why women now start to go, well, now all of a sudden I'm intolerant to these foods, gluten, you know, that they weren't intolerant to before. And right. their natural detoxification pathways start to shut down because the kidney, kidney, the liver, the gallbladder are all sort of overwhelmed with these heavy metals and toxins. Right. Okay, so I'm curious. So first of all, you got your, your boobs done when you were how old? Uh, I was actually newly divorced. Okay. I was probably just 42 or something like that. Okay, and so not too long ago. Yeah, and okay. so I only had them in for about eight years, but I did feel that there was something wrong right off from the day dot. Mm. So what it was was um, a fold in the left side, which mm. I pointed out to the original implanting surgeon, but- Something the, you could see or just feel? I could feel it. Mm, okay. But because this type of doctor profession is only focused on our aesthetic outcome, sure. This is the first time I realised, and I had a chat with my diagnosing doctor of 31 years experience. She's an integrative medical doctor and a medical doctor. She also is a BII warrior herself. And she was like, you know what, Andy, we're actually realising that this is the first doctor profession where you go to them for aesthetics first and healthcare second mm. as their priority in seeing you. So they're constantly focused in the cosmetic world on the aesthetic. And right. so, you know, and we they don't know, they don't have that second step of people that are having a problem with it. Um, medically afterwards it's more just the aesthetic look or what that fold might potentially cause right you know you've got a great aesthetic result he kept saying but you know perhaps that fold could have become a weak point which in my case it did just like when you get sort of a piece of paper and you wet it and then you tear it sure. imagine that's what happened with the fold but these days you don't have to have a hole a traditional hole or even a fold for the implant to cause breast implant illness right you know um it wait let's talk about that for one yeah. second because you said bii a couple times i think a lot of people might not be aware of what bii really is i don't think there's actually a medical diagnosis per se right it's yeah. just a grouping of symptoms that um that mean you you have something toxic in your body, correct? Am yeah, and this is the big billion dollar question right now. And at the moment we're talking about turning this book into a documentary and we're researching, you know, the bleep out of it because it isn't an official diagnosis. It right. keeps getting swept under the rug. My bedroom is my sanctuary. When I moved to Florida, I couldn't wait to get a new bed and beautiful sheets. But did you know that traditional bed sheets can harbor more bacteria than a toilet seat? So gross. And besides that, it can lead to acne, allergies, and stuffy noses. But I'm happy to share that Miracle Made offers a whole line of self-cleaning, eco-friendly bedding that prevents 99% of bacteria and requires three times less laundry. That's sheets, pillowcases, and comforters. Think about how much time that will save you in the laundry room. I have been loving my Miracle Made bedding. It's super luxurious. It's like a five-star hotel kind of luxury, but in your own home. It's so soft and comfortable and it feels very expensive, but it's not. And with their self-cooling sheets, I have the perfect night's sleep all night, every night. It's a game changer. I got mine um, in the color navy. It's beautiful. I, I am going to be ordering sheets for all of my guest rooms um, because I just think the colors are, are like really exquisite and it makes your room um, look so much more, you know, uh, luxurious and expensive, I guess you would say. So go to trymiracle.com slash understood to try miracle made sheets today. And whether you're buying them for yourself or as a gift for a loved one, if you order today, you can save 40%. And if you use promo code understood at checkout, you'll get three free towels and save an extra 20%. Miracle is so confident in their product. It's backed with a 30 day money back guarantee. So if you aren't hundred percent satisfied, you'll get a full refund. So upgrade your sleep with Miracle Made. Go to trymiracle.com slash understood and use the code understood to claim your free Three piece towel set and save over 40% off. Again, that's miracle.com slash understood to treat yourself. Thank you, Miracle Made, for sponsoring this episode. 
Um, but there is new data coming out, like I said, to support that it is now the inflammatory driver causing the cytokine storm at the inflammatory response at the very least. Mm -hmm. But BII stands for breast implant illness. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what it's being called at the moment. Right. But it's a systemic issue. Yeah. And the symptoms are fatigue, joint pain, dry eyes, brain fog. Were those the symptoms you were experiencing? I had them all. I also had SIBO gut, so the digestive issues, inability to sweat, loss of libido, rapid hair loss. And this uh, accrued over eight years? Like, did you see it right at the beginning or did it get worse and worse for the years you had? You know, this is going to sound so crazy, but it was getting worse and worse towards the end. And also when we sort of went from this sort of, 4G world to the 5G world. Mm -hmm. And what I'm learning is that a lot of people are saying that the heavy metals are actually in interacting with the radiation. So when that ramps up, it created that brain fog or that tinnitus, that buzzing. So I was like feeling like I had this, like, I felt like I wasn't on the aeroplane with that zzz. Yep, it felt I like I mean. was the aeroplane. Mm. And it was so hard to describe. And so many other women feel like they had that radiation buzz as right. well. So as soon as the implants were removed, I'm telling you, that tinnitus and that buzzing sound just went away instantly. So I want to hear about your journey to actually deciding to get um, them removed. But I, I, I do actually want to share a story with you because I'm. It, it really reminds me of something for me. So I have, you know, I'm 49. I've had my boobs done a bunch of times. Oh, did I'll, you? More I'll than be once. Honest. Yeah. yeah. So I started small, then I went a little bit bigger, then I moved to Vegas mm -hmm. and I was working in Vegas for many years and I went very big. Mm -hmm. Then I went smaller because as my life developed and I was no longer living in Vegas right. as someone who needed to look that way aesthetically, um, it became ridiculous looking. So I had them made smaller. Then what happened like two or three years ago during COVID, I started to have um, a lot of pain in my shoulder. Oh, I thought no. it was my shoulder. And then I realized it was kind of on the side of my breast. And I thought maybe in my armpit. And for maybe six months, I kept, you know, thinking it was a rotator cuff. I kept thinking there was something going on, you know, within my body up here. Yeah. But I felt feverish and I didn't feel right. Oh, and, right. Um, you know, long story short, I finally went to see um, my doctor, yeah. my breast doctor, the original implant, the doctor. original doctor who, as you're saying, had nothing to tell me. They were like, you know, they did an MRI. I had an MRI done. Right. There was nothing in the MRI. <clears throat> and he said, if you want to go get another, you know, if you want to go get them redone, you can do that. Well, I went to a reconstruction guy down here in Florida, mm -hmm. a really great guy. And long story short, um, when he looked at me and felt around, he's like, I believe you have a rupture. I believe it's, you know, imperative we do this very soon. Mm -hmm. I went in two weeks later, you know, you have to get the blood tests and all that stuff. So yeah. I, I did that. And then I went in two weeks later and he ended up, instead of just doing one and fixing it, when I came to, he's like, listen, I had to redo both mm -hmm. because this one was so ruptured mm -hmm. that I was worried about the other one or that it may rupture and I got them both Perfect. done. Yeah. So... I do remember that was the hardest recovery I had because it wasn't like it wasn't an explant where they took them completely out. No. You know, um, was the rupture also was there a gel bleed or anything going on? Yes, there, there was a gel bleed and yeah. they had to do a lot of scooping and scraping a lot of from scraping. The lymphatic system. Exactly. So my recovery, you know, I used to be able to get my boobs done and like go for a walk the next day. You know, like I I was like surgery, you know, queen. Like I, I knew yeah. how to do it. I, yeah. The pain was not an issue. I never had to take pain pills. It was like a, yeah. an easy walk in the park for me. It was so hard to recover from that. And I spent months not feeling well. And yeah. I started to research BII because mm -hmm. I started to feel like something was not right. Mm -hmm. Now, I will say I still have my boobs. Mm -hmm. I did not end up getting mm -hmm. an explant. Yeah. But I will tell you for a year afterwards, I felt like something was wrong. Yeah. I did feel all those symptoms. I felt yeah. like no one was listening to me. They kept saying, oh, it's fibromyalgia. It's depression. Yeah. It's, you know, some yeah. some people were talking about this 5G thing. Um, oh, really? Yes, I, yeah. they were. They wow. were telling me that it was the metals in the air and that it was affecting me. And But I went to see the doctor who had done that new revision. So you mean the radiation in the air and the heavy metals interacting? Yes. Yeah, yeah. And... Um, the doctor just kind of was unable to help because as you're saying, he was about the aesthetic. He's like, your he boobs relate. look amazing. Yeah. And you know, I, if you want to get them taken out, that's your choice. So now to get back to you, what I ha never got to that point because finally, you know, I started feeling okay, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and that went away. But for you, it got to a point where you had to make the decision. Yes, this is what I have. Yes, this is toxic to my body and I mm -hmm. want them out. Yeah. How did you get to that decision? 
Wow, this is so multi-layered. And first of all, I just want to thank you for sharing that very personal story because it is so personal. You don't yeah. have to share it. Yeah, I've um, never told anyone about it. Yeah. Yeah. And like, you know, at the time when you're feeling unwell, it's a lot, Rachel. Like, yeah. you know, it takes you back there. It's hard not to feel those feelings of, mm -hmm. you know, how sort of lost and, un, you know, well you really have And it's been. like an invisible, invisible illness mm -hmm. because you know you might look fine yes but you don't feel fine yes. and you cannot explain it to people and yes. people are kind of sick of you saying that you feel sick yeah you because know? you look fine what are you complaining about yeah. right right and it's just your boobs right, right. so right. there's a very special reason why i also called it chest treasured chest mm. because i wanted to remove the the notion around it being this you know boob jug tit whatever it's right. like it's our chest if anything it's our breast and also what's behind that is our hearts yeah. you know and, and it's our entire system i mean one my second book was about parenting right so i've got one of the contributors in the book Pinky McKay, she's Australia's top lactation consultant. We always had these discussions about like, even in a female fetus, when that female fetus is being developed, the immune cells are what are the breast you know, tissues. Mm -hmm. So it's starting off as immunity. It's so much more. Our breasts are so much more than we realize. This is why they right. affect so much in our entire system. So coming back to sort of what made me go, right, this is it, I have to do it. Mm -hmm. About five, six years ago, I had a PTSD diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't really believe in labeling and stuff like that. But at the time I was really grateful for that diagnosis because it gave me time to really sort of take time off and heal and really work on myself. Mm -hmm. About two years into it, my psychologist, who's also a hypno hypnotherapist said to me, wow, listen to you, you're really moving from clinical psychology to positive psychology. Listen to you talking mm -hmm. about what you're gonna do with the world and the future and all that sort of stuff. And I was like, yes. And then I went home and I was like, well, hang on a second. My medical doctor said to me, that you've got BII about a year ago. And I kind of went, no, I don't. Mm. But the symptoms were getting bigger. The anxiety and the depression was still there. Even though I had moved from a clinical diagnosis to this positive psychology diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And I was like, then why do I still feel depressed? Why do I still have the anxiety? Why am I still having this inability to take a deep breath? Mm. All of these things were going on. Then it also coupled with some inflammation under the arm. So I also, I'm like a huge gym fan. Mm -hmm. I was doing like leg squat, uh, squats or leg press and my knees would inflame like this old gal. Wow. I'm like, I'm a health and wellness person. I don't get inflammation in the knees. What's right. this new thing? So every time I would do squat, it would like inflame for like a week mm. and I'd be taking so many supplements. I'd be taking all the anti-inflammatory su supplements, the turmeric and everything that I could do. It was getting to a point where I was taking so many supplements. I was mm. sick of putting pills in my mouth yeah. or nutrition in my mouth just to stay stable. Yeah. I was remembering the times where I was like, I would really, there would be no ceiling as to how healthy and well I would be. And now I'm just doing all of these things to stay stable, like what the F? Mm -hmm. So I started looking at this as a serious diagnosis and yeah. I refused to read the research because it was scary. I couldn't look at the explant videos because yeah. when they remove the implant, they also have to take the surrounding scar tissue tissue which is the capsule mm. which also needs to be sent off to the labs to be tested for new types of cancer squamous so cell mm. carcinoma anaplastic large cell lymphoma are the two types of cancers that are found now in the surrounding scar tissue because the body wants to wall it off wants mm. to wall off that foreign object from spilling into the rest of the system but we are the system like everything's connected right yeah so i started going okay you're a health and wellness expert you really need to look into this and you really need to do the deep work so i kind of like coached myself and i was like this is what we're going to do we need to do this you know i was starting to say to myself at what cost yeah. you know at what cost was i hanging on to this old body you know, mm. instead of evolving and becoming the, the woman that I always wanted to be. I'm getting goosebumps now. Yeah. That's why you can see on the cover, I'm just holding my chest, but in a way where I'm looking at you, where it's kind of like, I've got me, yeah. but I've also been through a lot. And don't you worry, I'm here for good now. You mm. know, I've got you too. So, um, you know, and, and it's a brave cover. I remember speaking to my publicist, Matt, you know, who's always been there for me the whole way. And he was like, no, we need to do this showing your scars. It's challenging for the audience to look at it. And it's mm -hmm. a talking point. And I remember going to sleep before I pressed print on the, you know, cover. 
<laughs> and I was like, what have I done? Everyone's going to be looking at my chest like that. I really don't want them to be staring at me like this all the time. But, you know, again, we have to own our scars. We have to own who we are. Yeah. It's a really big scar. It's not like a small one when you put them in because they're taking out that surrounding right. scar tissue as well at the same time. So, I mean, that was it for me. I was like, right, at what cost? Let's get well, let's do this. Uh, I was gonna have to eventually do it. So I thought, may as well just do it now. I mean, it's like when you have a child, you're never ready to have a child, but right. you know, you just gotta do the That's work. Happened. So I'm curious, wh how big had you gone when you got your boobs done? Yeah, so it wasn't even that big. It was just a tiny bit bigger than what I am okay. now. And so that's why I really realised that this was this protective wall, this armour, you know. And I remember saying to psychologists, first of all, I'm going to be taking away that armour. Second of all, so I, I'm really exposed now. My heart's really exposed yeah. to my future lover, you know. And, um, and the other thing was... The scars to me look, were like war wounds. Yeah. I didn't want to have the lift. I didn't want to be upsold the secondary surgery. Mm -hmm. You know, would you like fries with that? I call, you know, the fat transfer or the lift. I'm like, do not make me a forever customer. I'm, I'm tapping out. Yeah. And you know- That's an amazing concept actually, that you were like, I'm done with this. Yeah. I'm going back to being me. Yeah, you know? don't get me wrong. Like it was a hard journey to come yeah, to terms no, with. Yeah, I get it. Um, I'm curious, so did they express to you what you know, when people do this, they do this for an aesthetic look, obviously. So when you were taking them out, were you worried about what would be left? A hundred percent. But the terminology saggy is a really good one to exploit. Okay. Because in America, I understand, sorry, in Australia, you're not allowed to use the term mummy makeover or mommy makeover. Oh. Yeah, it's very derogatory, like just because a mum has had her oh, body put through something. Mm -hmm. So in their social media campaigning and everything, it's illegal to use that term when they're selling any cosmetic type of surgery. Oh, interesting. In their marketing. It's still allowed here in America, which got me thinking, like, why is it allowed? Why do we, you know, call women saggy? Why do we say they need a makeover because they're now a mum? Mm -hmm. So it really got me thinking about the international narrative about the culture around why we're doing this to ourselves in the first place. And if we could potentially change that to help us feel more queens and you know put us on pedestals sure. for what we have been put through and for men to step up as kings too and go, wow, I really love that about you. Right. So were you dating someone at the time? Uh, like I was seeing people here and there, but no one's serious. I right. think it was a real time for me. I'd also lost my libido full stop because yeah. it was just making me so unwell. At one point in the shower, I felt something move and slip into the rib cage. Mm. I freaked out and like, cause it was starting to contract. That's mm. called contracture. And because I was in stage two contracture, six surgeons and an MRI kept saying, you're fine. But yeah. I knew something was wrong. Right. I knew I was buzzing and I was gel bleeding and this was a fold and it was moving. And right. so they were like, well, we've got time. So the sad thing was that I wasn't triaged. It should have been a case of 911, get her to the ER now. Like you got to go into surgery straight away, right? Yeah. Who knows how long my silicon was bleeding into my system. Yeah. Yeah, and it could kill people, right? I mean, talk about that, that it there is. are serious ramifications for people that just let this keep going. Women are dying. Millions of women are dying a slow death because of this, because their bodies are starting to shut down. Mm. I get daily DMs still because I went on the Today Show and that video is still circulating. Hopefully this one will too and we can help women have regular checkups and things like that. Yeah. But, you know, it's getting to the point where women are going... I felt medically gaslit. Yeah. I'm being told that I'm fine, mm -hmm. but I'm not, mm -hmm. you know, or I'm being told that you're going to look saggy like I got told. So right. let's and go back. And there's so much to that. There's psychological and mental, like they're nervous they're, they won't be attractive anymore. They're nervous their husband won't find them attractive or they won't, if they're single, that they won't be able to get someone to love them if they look different and not like what you see in the magazines or how you want to see yourself. I totally get that. And I think it's really important what you're saying about you know being your own advocate for your mental health. I mean, and for your mental health, your physical health, um, no one knows you better than you. You've lived with your body, you know what feels right, you know what doesn't feel right. And, you know, another story I'll share with you that I haven't really spoken about okay. is that for years um, I had headaches and backaches, Ooh. very terrible. This yeah. is unrelated to plastic surgery, but, um, you know, and even since I was like four or five, you know, I had very bad um, headaches. And eventually when I turned 40, I, I was getting, you know, injections into my back for how 
painful. Like you cortisone? Know, yeah, cortisone, um, for how much pain I was going through. <laughs> and eventually they did an MRI. And one doctor um, said, I need to get a second opinion before I give you this minimal surgery, but you know, we'll do it in the office. And I happened, I lived in New York at the time, I happened to go to a guy who was the um, surgeon for the Jets and the Giants. And, you know, he did a lot of athletes, so he knew what he was talking about with backs, you know, people. And it happened to be a friend of his. So he, I went into his office to get the results, and I thought I was just picking up my results to take back to my doctor to say, okay, we can do this now. Got it. And he looked at me and he said, you don't need back surgery, you need brain surgery. Ooh. And I froze. I was like, what do you mean? Mm -hmm. And he's like, you have Chiari. And fast forward to what I'm trying to share with you was that yeah. when they finally, when I finally got into a doctor's office who could sit down with me and say, you need surgery, it's as black and white, you have Chiari, um, I felt so good because I felt like I had a diagnosis for something that mm -hmm. for my whole life I had been saying, I don't feel well, I have a headache, I have a backache, yeah. it's not making sense. And I had been sent to neurologists, to therapists saying that, again, you have fibromyalgia, it's depression, it's a backache, it's migraines, and right. then you get treated with different pills yeah. for those things and you miss out on the core of what's going on. And misunderstood. What, <laughs> yeah, misunderstood. And what Chiari is for people that are listening that may have symptoms mm -hmm. like this, um, you know, one in a thousand people have it, but it's very rarely diagnosed. And it is a birth defect. A lot of um, athletes do get it from getting hit. But it means that when you were born, your brain cavity kind of did not close properly around your brain. And I've spent my life with my brain sinking into my spine, yeah. which gives you the symptoms of headaches, backaches, word flipping, like almost like playing charades, like I couldn't finish my sentence some of the time, and then tingling in your hands and your feet. Now, these are symptoms that many people have, you know, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. are not sure, you know, they all, they think that they're all sorts of different things. Mm -hmm. But if you have symptoms like that, and it hasn't gone away with certain mm -hmm. treatments, um, you know, Chiari is something that you should look into. And the point is, is I was my own advocate. I kept saying there's something more you're not understanding. Yes, I'm depressed about normal things in like, but life, but that's not yeah. what I'm feeling. And yes, I might have headaches or yes, I feel this way, but that there's more to it. And finally, I found the doctor that understood me. And it sounds like that happened with you too. The person that wrote your foreword, right, was your doctor. Yeah, I think there's a lot to be said about women's intuition, which is what this is a running theme mm. of now. My doctor woke me up or my surgeon woke me up from, you know, the anesthetic and said, you were right. You're better than an MRI. Mm. You taught me a lot today and I'm going to go and check the rest of my patients. You knew exactly where this hole was in the left side. It was exactly to where you were pinpointing it to be. Yeah. So, you know, medicine isn't a perfect science. No. There's new technology coming out now that can finally pick up in a CT scan, not an MRI, the silicon uptake in the lymphatic system, like in a 4D scan. I was in Australia recently and I found this machine. I'm desperate to get in contact with the company, the maker mm -hmm. uh, that does this and collaborate with them to, you know, every clinic should have this, you know. Yeah. But, you know, the, the misdiagnosis, the misunderstanding, being misunderstood, you know, mm -hmm. and then the theme of that with women having intuition. We know our bodies. Yeah. Sometimes we are better than medicine. We are better than science. Yeah. It's, it's hard to explain. So, yes, we need to work together. And Professor Diva, who did do my surgery, wrote in his forward and he's also a contributor in the book you know listen to your patients is the opening quote yeah. and doctors need to do more of that you know think about the Hippocratic Oath to do no harm that's what yeah. they take you know are they potentially doing harm by only focusing on cosmetic and I plan to change the way the profession practices I'm already doing that just with my story by educating others as well mm -hmm. they do need to listen to us more yeah so how are you feeling now that you've had this you know surgery? it's a journey I felt immediately great like when they were gone it was literally a weight lifted off my chest. I was also like, there's a hot guy. My libido came back <laughs> straight away. I knew I was healthy just because my libido was back. That's mm -hmm. a great objective marker. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my digestive system worked straight away. I was like not passing movements for 10 days. Yeah. I was like, if you don't get this crap out of me, I am dying. Yeah. So yeah, immediately that started working well. I went for a bit of a walk along the beach and I immediately started sweating again. Mm. So that brain buzzing went away but then a lot of sufferers or survivors also say that after the immediate fantastic effects they start having this lull again where they feel sick again that's where I say as a wellness coach we have to 
ramp it up to fifth gear, kick in the detoxification process up a notch. Yeah. You've gone through the emotional detoxing and the healing and coming to terms with your new body. Then that little elation. Mm -hmm. Then you have to go into a parasite gut cleanse. You need to go into a heavy metal detox and potentially a mold detox as well because mm. that's a breeding feeding ground for all of those things. Right. Just because it's been taken out doesn't mean it's still not there in your cells and in your well, body. Well, like right? in your story, you had this silicon bleeding and, you know, hopefully your body was starting to detox some of that. Yeah. Um, but it's always a good idea to go into a really heavy detox and the heal is real, they say. Yeah. It takes time healing takes time so I'm still healing okay well you look great I mean oh, you could you wouldn't yeah. know I mean I'm looking for people listening I'm looking at her boobs and they look great oh thank <laughs> so you you, look you know I love to say that everybody looks great yeah. our chests are all beautiful I mean I'm my whole heroes are the women who are having mastectomies and still opting to not put in breast implants mm, and they're yeah. embracing their flat I've got a good friend who just recently found out she had breast cancer and I messaged her and I was like babe how are you she goes I can't read your book yet it's heavy for me mm. I'm gonna have a mastectomy because I'm stage two cancer but I've decided you're gonna be proud I've just I was like proud don't you worry about me you do what you need to yeah. do but you are my hero yeah. next message I got from her she shaved her head I was like wow you are stunning yeah you know, and, and this is the stuff that's happening. You know, we spend a couple of dollars on a pink ribbon for Breast Cancer Awareness Month, mm -hmm. but then we don't realise that that money is also going to the manufacturers that are creating the new types of cancers as well that right. are going back into the body after a mastectomy. Right. So, you know, I have a question because people are obviously, women are obviously going to continue to get their breasts yep. done. I yep. mean, the fear of this, I don't think is as widespread as we're talking about right now yeah. that people see where this could lead down the road for them. Yeah. So would you have any suggestions for people that are continuing to keep their breasts in or choosing to get them done, yeah. um, how to have that, but have it in a safe way and be safe about it? Yeah, at some point in our life, we're gonna have to get ready to shed. Mm -hmm. And when they're ready, I'm here, mm. you know, and when you wanna, discuss you know the symptoms that you're having with your doctor and start to join the dots then you know you have a team of people around you to help you through that it has to be your own divine timing yeah mm -hmm. I don't judge anyone who does anything it's their own soul's journey just like mine I think it's really important to be sensitive around this topic and not my my intention is not to instill fear not to rush out and right. do anything but to really carefully be informed um, and then you can make your own informed decision in your own divine timing I'm curious if you think that women should not put this kind of thing in their body because at some point there will be a toxic um, adjustment for them and it, it'll be a problem or do you think it only affects certain people that just cannot handle having um, something foreign in their bodies? From the research I've done, it is a ticking time bomb. You do think there so. is new data that came out in May of last year from Professor Diva indicating that breast implants are an inflammatory driver creating the cytokine storm. You can't look past that research. So if you had a daughter, you would not let her get a boob job? I would highly advise that she didn't, yeah. Right. Anyone that I love, you know, but at the same time, one of my best friends did. She's a healer. Mm. I was like, no. And she was like, you know what, darling? She goes, I've been through trauma. I'm you, like mm. years ago. And she needs to go through her own path. It's her own journey. I had to make peace with that. It felt like it was me all over yeah. again. But then I just love her and I hold space for her. And again, when she's ready to face that, I'm here. Right. So obviously, you know, as I said at the beginning, you have written so many books. It's not just this one. <laughs> I want to kind of get into some of the other um, books that you have written about. So you've written, let's see, a, about wellness, dating, nutrition. Um, you wrote a book on wellness loading, talking about disconnecting to technology and social media at times. Yeah. So I want to get into some of those paths for you. <laughs> what, what, first of all, what was your favorite book to write? Uh, probably the first one, mm -hmm. which became, I repackaged it up as connected, a paradigm shift in how we view health. And it goes into understanding how the body works to heal itself when we give it the right environment. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's available on Audible now. So it's just, it's the most fun book that just continues to sell. Right. It's not the one that got the most publicity. So the one that I had the most fun with, with my publicist was hashtag Insta lovers. Yeah, tell me about that. Digital dating, DM disasters, oh, and boy. you know, love stories, but sliding into the DM. So that was born out of that 
sliding into the DM culture. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, nobody had written a book of rules about dating apps. So I did as a newly divorced woman right. and had so much fun discovering what the flaws were and how to weed out the weirdos and keep them safe. And Okay, wait, wait, wait. So we need to talk about that for a second. <laughs> it's a great book. So, uh, yeah, I have to read that. That's great. Yeah. So first of all, is there one app that you think is better than the other? I mean, there's so many yeah. out there now. It's hard to know where to look. That's right. And it keeps changing. But I think that there's different apps for different age groups okay. as well. So I feel like, yes, you will probably get more guys in their sort of 50s and stuff like that on the Tinder app. Okay. Um, and I feel like it's because they don't realize when they become newly divorced that there are other apps like Hinge and Bumble. Oh, that's and, so funny you know, that you say that. So you think they're not used to it. They don't know. So they go on <laughs> Tinder because they've think heard of it. Tinder got a lot of good and bad exposure when it first came out. It was kind of the pioneer of the profession, right? Right. So I feel like that's my theory on why there are a lot of men like that. But then they don't always behave correctly. Mm. So if you want like a quality connection, I do find that there is a little bit of better behavior on Hinge. Okay. But if you're in your like 20s, 30s, late 30s, maybe early 40s, I still think Bumble's a great one as well. Okay. I'm just not a fan of how the women have to do the reaching out first. The theory is that, you know, she's in control. But from my research, I've also found that it emasculates the man. They oh, can't do anything. Thing, you okay. know, and they want to be the one to also instigate and they're sitting there waiting with their hands tied right. for a woman to call the shot type thing. Yeah. But what I have found is since I've written the book and discovered all their flaws and said, this is what you need to do. You need to verify them. You need to, you know, find out their other social media. You need to have a video call before you meet them in real life. Yeah. All these sorts of things to keep you safe. The apps have started to step up. They've included verification. Mm -hmm. There is now voice notes, videos, all that sort of stuff to check that the person's real. Right. My biggest tip though to keep you safe is if you're asking for their other social media account for example you said show me your instagram mm -hmm. before i you know keep talking to you because you don't want to be talking to a catfish right a lot of people have also you know rigged that system and created an instagram account where what? they've oh my god if you look through the photos that they have uploaded so they could create a fake instagram account to go with their fake dating profile account mm -hmm. just make sure that you're watching who are the people that are interacting with them underneath if they're real people because yeah. if they've got no likes or a bunch of likes and no comments and all of the photos on instagram have been uploaded within the space of a week then you know they've just quickly pulled that together right okay yeah so yeah just keep it in mind i also have found that if you do a little research on these people and you see who they're following yeah um or who they're liking their things you know if it's a group of women that are all in their 20s and they all look a certain way you yeah. can tell that they're out for one thing right yeah um, I'm looking for someone who's like marriage minded and monogamous and mm. wants to be in a real relationship so to me I would not date men like that yeah so there are red flags that I can see automatically but I will you know it's very funny my daughter who's 11 oh yeah just last week her friend was over and they were in the room doing something and finally I went in and I said what are you guys doing they were giggling they had created a profile on hinge oh and before I was like what what do you mean and they did it they found some kids picture off the internet and created wow. a whole fake profile wow. and they already were getting messages from people so of course I deleted it for them, Good right? Mom, yeah. But they were, but they were like, "Mom, see how easy this is. You got to be careful when you're dating, you True. know." And I had never really thought of that, like how easy it is for people to just fake everything, you know? Yeah. So I find that to be really, really scary. Well, for somebody like you with a public profile, I would only suggest you get on something like Raya. You know what's funny? I've been on Raya's waiting list for seven years. Well, I'm going to add you and we'll make that speed up. With okay, because <laughs> I don't understand. I think they have like my wrong Instagram and I don't know how to fix it. And I can't just delete the whole application and start over. Right. But every time I like go back on to look, it's like I see that it's still on this waiting list. And I was like, this is ridiculous. Look, girl, I don't <laughs> think you're going to have any problem in the dating field. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I'm very picky. And yeah. I think you are probably yeah. too and we have children and yeah. we have a whole life going on and you're in the public eye too now mm -hmm. and it's like you know you're very you kind of don't need a man for a lot of reasons that maybe 100%. when we were younger we thought we did or we thought we were going to be in love for different yeah. reasons so for me I really want an asset I want someone who's like a teammate I want a witness to my life yeah and someone who's going to make a difference as opposed to someone who just you know is there because they're there I want someone that's smarter than me sometimes I feel like I have to be the smartest one all the time and that's exhausting you mm. know I want to be the female once in a while I want to be the one that just gets to show up and be cute whatever but that's never 
the, you know, where I can show up. It's like I'm always, you know, I'm the man and the woman in my life because I'm a single mom and I take care of my daughter. And, you know, of course, her dad is in the picture, but I have her most of the time. And it's, you know, there's a lot. There's a lot that we have to do to make our lives fulfilling without a man. So to have some man step in the picture, they better be really spectacular and extraordinary. Yeah. I feel like that's you're calling it in. It's coming in for you this year for sure. Oh, well. And at the same time, you know, I just want to address how healthy it is to flirt. Yeah. You know, it's great for the oxytocin. So while we're on that, you know, superwoman, single mom, playing this crusade and helping others journey, it's mm -hmm. really important to kind of just say, I'm going to have a flirt today or I'm going to tell someone that they've got a beautiful, you know, personality right. or whatever and just really do that for others so that you can feel good in your oxytocin release and your serotonin and you know decreasing all of those stress home hormones just by having fun like I flirting so bring that into your life and get that happening and you don't have to find it on a dating app but it's right. just one of those other tools in your bag of tricks because i feel like it helps you with the flirting muscle yes it exercises right. that so that when you're in real life and you're kind of like hey how are you because you're already doing it do you know what i mean yeah but it's so true because a lot of people don't show up in their life and seem available i've had mm -hmm. some people on the show that have talked about dating tips and relationship tips and if you think about it when you go to the supermarket you have your hat on your sunglasses on you're not available for people to come up and talk to you so true. it's kind of just making yourself um, more available. Um, okay, before we end this, I want to talk a little bit about nutrition. Um, what should we stay away from mm. in nutrition? Yeah, definitely the inflammatory foods. What so I those? just recently did a detox from all the inflammatory drivers, which are the sugars, the wheats, the dairy, the alcohol, okay. gluten. Um, so and even if you don't have a gluten intolerance, you shouldn't be eating these things well think? yeah wheats and glutens and breads and pastas and rice and potatoes all help create that warm damp candida environment which is a perfect breeding ground for parasites okay. and so you know we all have parasites mm -hmm. but it's just really good to do a detox once or twice a year i mean your body can just take a break for a little while there's nothing yeah. wrong with that you know just reset the nervous system the immune system and all that sort of thing so i'd definitely say detox from parasites and heavy metals couple of times a year if possible um, and then just generally you know if you can kill it and grow it you should eat it mm. food that is alive gives you life so that's not necessarily a paleolithic concept you can be a vegan too but I'm talking about eating fresh live whole foods okay. within that whole food source you have micronutrition so the vitamins and minerals macronutrition is fats proteins and carbohydrates that's a fitness thing mm. you know you can be fit lean shredded but it doesn't necessarily mean you're well are you fertile right. you know so that's like a bodybuilder concept but it's not a wellness concept so the wellness concept for things like anti-aging and immunity and all that sort of stuff is to make sure that your micronutritional uptake is there mm -hmm. and at the same time have a great working nervous system gut health and hormones with things like chiropractic or getting detoxing off the technology having quality sleep yeah. mindfulness all of those things to allow the maximum assimilation of nutrition because you could have great organic organic foods and things, supplements, but if your assimilation or ability to use that nutrition isn't there, you may as well be peeing it out. Mm. So it really is a holistic uh, look and response to how we treat our bodies, which is this fun, ongoing life journey. Yeah. Um, do you believe that people should take a break from drinking or do you believe in one glass of wine a day is really healthy? Yeah, you know, having a break from anything is great. But I also found that, you know, having a glass of organic, preservative-free red wine or whatever it is that you want to do, you know, w once a week when you're unwinding can also be beneficial. You have to kind of weigh up the, you know, reason for your drinking. You know, am yeah. I doing it when I'm feeling good or am I just wasting myself? Think about the term getting wasted. You're just wasting your life. Yeah. Well, that's really interesting to think of it in that way. Okay. Um, all right. So people can get Treasured Chest at Amazon, right? And do you have a website where people can look up your book? Yeah, because Amazon actually do keep hiding it blurring the image sensitive content so if you can't find oh. it there it should be there on kindle but if you can't find it there and you do want to get a signed printed copy it's on my website andylew.com okay perfect spell your name a-n-d-i-l-e-w like okay. lewis.com mm -hmm. and um because you've written so many books and you're so good at it can we expect another book out of you in the future <laughs> 
<laughs> I know. It's like, what am I doing? <laughs> because, you know, every time I release another book, I'm like, I'm never doing this again. And right. then I get an idea for another one. I have thought about a parasite uh, detox diet sort of yeah. recipe book and then some other ones. But I'm like, I need a break. <laughs> oh, my gosh. OK, well, hopefully in the future there will be something else. I know people will be interested. But people have 10 books to go through. That's right. Before they need to worry about what you're coming. You guys need now. to catch up on those ones. before. Right. So <laughs> tell people where they can find your podcast, where they can find all your stuff one more time. Thank you. So well to do is the name of the podcast. Okay. AndyLou.com is my website. Andy.lou on Instagram. Slide into my DMs. I'll never ghost you. <laughs> that was one of my other favorite books. It's right. all about ghosting. Where'd they go? Right. I'm always there. Don't worry. I won't ghost you. <laughs> <laughs> so you do read your DMs and respond. To them. I do. I love that grassroots connection yeah. of the people, you right. know, it can be exhausting. So I do try and take breaks, but I will get back to you. Yeah. All right. Perfect. Andy, it was such a pleasure. Uh, again, you are beautiful inside oh. and out. And I'm, I'm just so honored you were here with me. Well, it's the beauty in you that sees the light in me. So thank you. Thank you so much for listening to Misunderstood. I'm your host, Rachel Yucatel. Please be sure to subscribe to the show and give us a five-star rating and review. You can support the show by joining our Patreon at patreon.com slash misunderstood with Rachel Yucatel. Do you have ideas for the show or want to reach out? Email us at info misunderstood podcast at gmail.com. That's spelled M-I-S-S understood. Thank you so much and I'll see you next time. Misunderstood.